principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. The more I look at myself, the more I grow, and the more I hate myself. I just see this terrible, terrible creature that I just don't know why God put it, me on this earth. It felt good to be empty. It, it felt good not to have cheeks. This week on The Local Show, we take you inside the hidden world of eating disorders. Later tonight, KCPT brings you a national documentary that chronicles the millions of Americans suffering from anorexia and bulimia. Remarkably, they are conditions that have the highest fatality rate of all psychiatric disorders. Yet, as you're about to see, it's becoming increasingly difficult to get a health insurance company to cover its treatment. We go inside a Kansas City area group home that's helping local women cope with eating disorders. And we talk to area experts about the growing number of men and boys now asking for help. Stay with us for this special edition of The Local Show. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. Last summer, the Metro's last remaining inpatient eating disorders unit shut its doors. The closing of the 16-bed facility at Research Medical Center now means that Kansas Citians in need of inpatient care for anorexia or bulimia now have to travel as far away as St. Louis and Tulsa. In just a moment, we talk about what that means for patients here in Kansas City. But first, meet Marta. I remember being a really young girl, five or six years old, and being at the mall and watching this bigger woman eating a hot dog, and this voice came into my head and told me, that's what you are going to look like when you get older. And so growing up until I was about 11 years old, I always had that voice following me around, telling me that I was never good enough or that I was too big. And so when I got into sixth grade and started puberty and my body started changing. I just stopped eating lunch and it just progressed from there. Growing up, I felt like I was the rock in my family. My parents were arguing a lot. I kind of felt like I had to take care of my brother and protect him from that. And then I felt like I had to be this, this good girl. If I was this good girl that maybe they wouldn't argue anymore. So I felt out of control in my family that I couldn't you know, help my parents get along, that I couldn't be there for my brother. The eating disorder made me feel like I could control it. Once I got into high school, the pressures of trying to fit in and the pressures of school in general, no matter how much I restricted, it didn't work anymore. So throwing up was, was what worked. And once I threw that up, once I could see this thing that I had created in front of me, this vomit in the toilet. I was proud of it. It was something that I had done and that I had gotten rid of and it was something that I could see. It was the pain that I could see in the toilet bowl in front of me and I could flush it down the toilet and forget about it and I felt like I could fly afterward. This was my Bible. This was the little book that I created and lived by. Everything that went inside of me and everything that came out of me was in this. I have my morning weight and then I have every single thing that I ate that day um, and every calorie and the fat calories that were in it too. I was 19 years old. It was the second year, my second year in college and I think I was binging and purging seven or eight times a day. 
Marta is just one of the women you will meet in Erasing Eating Disorders, a national public television documentary coming up at 8 here on KCPT or immediately following the local show if you're watching the rebroadcast of this program. Joining me now is Mary Beth Blackwell, director of the Eating Disorder Resource Center at Jewish Family Services, and Corey hintz bone executive director of the Renew Counseling Center, an intensive outpatient program for eating disorders based in in Olathe. We very much appreciate you both being with us on the local show. But I started the program talking about the fact that we no longer have an inpatient uh, treatment facility right here in Kansas City. What does that mean for patients in Kansas City, Mary Beth? What that means is patients have to go to the east part of the state of Missouri. There are some residential facilities there, and they have to go to Denver or to Tulsa to get some type of inpatient treatment, none of which are high-level care, acute care, medical facilities, which was what we had here at Research. And your jaw dropped when you heard the news, uh, Corey. Yeah, I um, was referring people pretty much weekly or every couple of weeks to inpatient. And being at something here in Kansas City was really nice because the family and loved ones could be easily involved. And I find that's a key piece for someone to heal from an eating disorder is to be able to have family members um, aggressively involved in their treatment. So now that they have to drive four hours or fly on an airplane for treatment, I think that's a huge loss for the Kansas City area. Talk to me about the kinds of patients that you're seeing at your own facility at Renew in Olathe. We just saw Marta in the video. Uh, some people have a view that that anorexia, bulimia, eating disorders is a white woman's, a well-to-do person's mm -hmm. disorder. Yeah, in our program right now, for example, we have an African-American woman. We have a couple different males, one in their 20s, another in their 40s. Um, yes, we do have white people, you know, as well. But there are more and more um, increase in likelihood and statistics of not just the middle class white Americans who have this illness. Um, so there's definitely been an increase. How about for you, Mary Beth? Who are the people coming to your doors? We have quite a mix. Um, we have uh, definitely, we have, I have quite a few males um, on my client list and uh, teenagers. Uh, I also have a, a large number of uh, elderly, meaning like over the age of 50, mm -hmm. which is not a, a usual demographic that you see in eating disorders, uh, but it happens and it's there and we see a, an actual increase post, in postmenopausal women that they will, may not have an eating disorder earlier on, but as they go through menopause or a divorce or children leaving home that they develop an eating disorder late in life. So I have a, a, a good mix of that on my client list as well. Now you also talked about the fact that you were seeing more boys coming to see you too. Why, why is that? Well, I think with um, men and boys in general is that there's been a, a, this misconception that it is a, a woman's disease and there's been some shame and stigma for seeking treatment for a woman's disease. So a lot of men don't get treatment, but also a lot of men may not even realize they have an eating disorder. They feel like maybe they're working out and they're... Uh, trying to body build and maybe they're taking steroids or some type of supplements but they become obsessed with it to the point where their body weight gets very low or their body fat percentage becomes extremely low and they may use uh, compensatory behaviors like purging or using laxatives to maintain weight and they don't even realize that they have an eating disorder. Just to add to that only one in ten people with an eating disorder get help. So you add that stat to a male that's having a woman's disease, so there's just such a few amount of people who know they have a problem and then get help for it. We'll discuss that more in just a moment, but first we want to take you inside a local group home for women learning to overcome their eating disorders. Talia House in Fairway in Johnson County is a six-person transitional home designed to fill an unmet need to help women who have been released from hospital for anorexia and bulimia but are not quite ready to resume their normal lives. My eating disorder began when I was 12 years old. I really started to feel like something, something was missing. So I slowly began paying more attention to what I was eating and as I was cutting foods out, my weight was shifting. And as my weight shifted, I started getting compliments. I would 
stare into the mirror and I would start from my head and go down my body and just list the things that I wanted to change and that I hated about myself. I remember I just stopped eating one day because things were stressful at home and um, being nine I didn't think about it. I just remember being scared to eat. I remember one time I was touched um, on my arm by my sister. She had ranch dressing on her finger. And at that point I was so starved and really just not cognizant of reality, so distorted that I scrubbed my arm. I was convinced that I was going to gain weight through that contact and I scrubbed it until it bled. I had to get the ranch dressing off. I just couldn't absorb those calories. It was July 8th that I ended up um, being admitted to a hospital in a medical unit. My weight was incredibly low. I was about 60% of my ideal body weight at that time. My heart rate was very slow. I, I thought I was going to die. It was, it was my sister's birthday. I had come home from the doctor and said, gosh, I just don't think that I'm gonna be here anymore. I love you guys so much um, and I'm sorry. When I was very young, about 18, I started thinking about the treatment of eating disorders and, and how to set people up for success. And I always thought that at some point I would just have a home where people can be accountable to each other and love each other and have community and recovery. In that moment, I felt like it was just kind of a, a pipe dream. Probably wouldn't ever happen, but I just thought that there is a better way to do recovery. My business partner, Amy, and I met over coffee and began to develop a concept that was Talia House. Talia House um, is a three-bedroom home in Fairway, Kansas. We have the ability to have seven residents living with us at a time. We also have women who come for groups during the morning and meal support, and then go back home to their families. We have so many different levels of care and they are all so necessary. But what tends to happen as people go through the course of care is that insurance really starts to mandate their wellness. So basically, once insurance runs out, once people run out of their residential benefits, they go home to no structure. There's really nothing in between. Everything about Talia House was healing, just and the response from the staff and the other residents during a group. Amy um, taught me how what full meant, which sounds so silly, but I didn't I didn't know, <laughs> you know, and they explained that me and taught me how to deal with food in the right way without making it more than what it was. The coping skills we teach in the groups are how to deal with those negative thoughts, those intense painful feelings, but cope in more productive ways. So you have to teach them things like, you know, let's go for a walk, let's do the deep breathing, you know, let's, um, let's just go put lotion on your legs and on your hands. Here was a really good place to be able to have other people pouring into you in a way that you stopped seeing yourself as the eating disorder and separating yourself from that and starting to find life outside of it. Just getting to the point where you eat a meal and then you realize, wait, I didn't totally dissect everything I ate that meal. I was hungry, so I ate it. Coming here, I learned that I am okay just being who I am, and I am worth a meal, and I am a valuable person. One of the biggest things I've learned is other people can't fix the eating disorder for you, and especially not you know, a loved one and a guy you're dating or even your parents. See, my body is something I want to care for, and um, I eat healthy fruits and grains and things that are feeding my my soul, really, and then going to the gym now is because I love it, because running feels good. It was not a punishment anymore. And I can't, I, I can't really tell you what that's like. Um, going now to the gym and 
feeling proud of myself because I'm strong. Um, <laughs> and running because I like it. And I also quit smoking too after I left here. It took a little while, but I did because I don't want to hurt my, myself anymore. It's still a choice every day though. I still have to make a decision because they'll have bad days and I'll have days where I don't feel successful or I feel rejected or whatever and I want to do that. I want to not have anything to eat just to because that's what I'm used to but I don't. <laughs> I eat and um, I live. I would really like to encourage anyone who hasn't gotten help before that you just need to do it. I had so many reasons before I got help here that I couldn't, but the reality is if it's not an unhappy and unsatisfying life, then it might be death as well. If I could help somebody, I would love to be able to. I would love to just tell them that they're, that they're, that, that they're valuable, that life is worth it, that hiding from themselves isn't gonna, isn't gonna help, that you can eat something. And, um, and then it does get better. It does. Yeah, it really does. That story by producer Kara Myers. Talia, by the way, means to flourish or to bloom in Greek. To allow them to help more people, supporters of Talia House are now on the lookout for a larger location. Insurance doesn't cover the cost of staying there, which can be around $6 thousand dollars a month but they are willing to work with patients and don't want the cost to be a barrier to treatment you can learn more about talia house at taliahouse.com or at the local show website uh, joining us now along with corey is sarah wiltshire whose daughter has struggled with an eating disorder for years and who has been an activist and lobbyist trying to bring attention to the lack of medical insurance coverage for eating disorder treatment sarah thank you so much for telling us your story uh piper is your daughter's name yes. and she's been struggling with anorexia since the age of 15. yes she came to us in about 2005 and um told her father and I that she was struggling at that point. She'd been restricting, but then she had started binging and purging. And she said that she was doing that and she couldn't stop and she was terrified and she asked for our help. Now, one of the problems for you, though, was you had health insurance. Yes. And she got so bad, uh, she couldn't walk. And yet you were struggling to actually get the health insurance company to pay for inpatient care. It's traumatic enough to have your daughter kind of disappear before your eyes and you can't stop it. Um, and throughout treatment, um, we were receiving really good help from the eating disorder professionals in the community throughout patient, but she was progressing in her illness and um, <clears throat> quite often we would be met with denials. They would ask for an extra day of care and they would get denials. Um, at one point in this, in one point in this journey in 2010, um, there was a team that her, our insurance had paid for. They, they had designated her to see, and she was seeing them, and then she was continuing to fail in her health. And um, they, actually the team came to her father and I and asked us that we should intervene, that she needed inpatient help, or they were worried that she wouldn't live at this point. She was admitted to an inpatient facility in, in Chicago and after and they were telling us that it would probably be months before she would be rate restored and for her mind to have an adequate amount of healing for her to even have therapy be effective for her she was not she was not well and then after six days in this treatment facility <clears throat> we received a call that um, our insurance company was going to stop payment but at that point when we thought we were very close to losing her and we had thought that but we were being told that by professionals and then to have it be cut off after um, just six days after six days when they were saying months it, it was terrifying and so I would try to call our carrier I was just put off and put off and put off and so I was desperate <laughs> and I didn't know what else to do and they I I went to Hobby Lobby and grabbed some cardboard and grabbed some friends and I went and picketed our insurance company just wanted to have someone to have a conversation about the insanity of this and my daughter's life was on the line so it was a desperate thing and I'm normally a very reasonable person and I'm a professional I work with physicians and yes. it just was a desperate act but 
it was a desperate thing. We just heard in the Talia house piece, <clears throat> Corey, of families just like Sarah's you know, who are in bankruptcy because of a child's eating disorder. You, you hear lots of stories like this? Absolutely. So um, even if you have insurance coverage, they never cover your dietitian. And you have to see a dietitian to learn weight, how to eat right or weight restored, um, as well as there often is limits to how, how long the insurance company will, how many days of coverage, whether it's outpatient or inpatient, there is. Well, let's look at what the insurance companies themselves are saying. Take a look at this. The problem with covering eating disorder treatments, insurance say, is there's no universally recommended care plan for treating anorexia and bulimia. According to Susan Paisano, a spokeswoman for America's health insurance plans, quote, there's a lack of evidence for what works and what doesn't work. Corey. I would strongly disagree with that. Um, they have found effective treatment is having a treatment team of a psychiatrist, doctor, dietitian, therapist, and they also have found certain effective therapeutic techniques that are needed. Have I met people and worked with people who have been fully healed from eating disorder? Yes, absolutely. So Sarah, how about your daughter Piper? How is she doing now? Actually, she's doing really well. Thanks for asking. She, um, she lives in Fort Collins, Colorado, and um, it's a university town with a lot of eating disorder support there, and she's really locked into her recovery, and she's really leaning into getting support, and she's, she's thriving, and it's, um, it's really wonderful to have her back. Coming up at 8.30 here on KCPT, POV shows girl model an unseen side of the modeling industry as talent scouts recruit prepubescent girls overseas. The fashion world, just another contributor to the unrealistic and unhealthy body images our young people feel they need to aspire to. She did more. Oh, oh, she really? Wow. There's some cute girls there. There's some nice ones. Wow. How old is she? I'll try. An excerpt from Girl Model coming up at 8.30 on KCPT. How much does culture play in the development of eating disorders? Back with us is Corey Hintz Bone, Executive Director of the Renew Counseling Center, and Mary Beth Blackwell, Director of the Eating Disorder Resource Center at Jewish Family Services. How much does culture play, Mary Beth? Young girls start looking at fashion magazines. They even have magazines uh, geared towards the junior high age. And these girls are not what an average girl looks like. And they're photoshopped and they're expected to look like that, as well as you'll see advertisements on TV for weight loss and plastic surgery. And so we're constantly being reinforced that we're not good enough. We don't look thin enough and we're not pretty enough. And young girls and young guys take these messages to heart and they really have body dissatisfaction at a young age. And that is one of the things we did at JFS is develop that pre-adolescent girls program at, to help address some of these issues and challenge these theories that you must look like what you see in the fashion industry. And finally, three things not to say to someone with an eating disorder, according to the Eating Recovery Center. One, why can't you just eat? Two, everybody hates their body sometimes. Three, yes, I'll keep your eating disorder a secret. So you have a brother, a sister, a daughter, a son, a friend. What are you supposed to say then? I think the most important thing you can say is that I hear you and I understand. I can understand why you feel the way that you do. I think validation is such an important part. Um, but th take it a step further. Validate th their feelings, but also acknowledge that, okay, maybe this is not 
normal or maybe this is a situation where you're you're getting into trouble and you need help and finding those resources is so so important and keeping it a secret is not going to help them even though they may ask you to there is so much shame and secrecy so if you see any signs to be able to go and approach them and say I really care about you I'm concerned about you I see that you go to the bathroom a lot after a meal or I notice you're losing weight I'm wondering, would you be open if I gave you some names and numbers to call or have me call with you to get help so we could see if you're struggling with anything that's more significant than just a diet? Mary Beth Blackwell and Corey Hintz Bone, thank you so much for being with us on this special edition of The Local Show. Mm -hmm. Thank you also for joining us. Stay with us for Erasing Eating Disorders and Girl Model right after ruckus tonight here on KCPT or immediately following the local show if you're watching the rebroadcast of this program. By the way, all of the agencies featured in this program along with their contact information can be found on the local show website at thelocalshow.org. You can also call the National Eating Disorder Hotline at 1-800-931-2237. I'm Nick Haynes, we'll see you next time on the local show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you.